This is the Tom Bigby Tales, and I'm your host, Shannon Evans. I write about a small town in northeast Mississippi called Columbus. Sometimes I write about the rest of the state. This episode is Heritage Academy Part 7, where the head of school is not qualified to lead. The Heritage Academy head of school is a football coach with a mediocre sports record over his head and drowning in the miasma of his incompetent leadership. I've already spoken at length about his two admin hires who were allowed to resign and retire to hide their alleged malfeasance. I have discussed the hypocrisy of the girls AD being pregnant and unmarried at the start of the school year. These are all hires made by Harrison from within the faculty, but his choice to elevate each of them to administration positions are his own. These alone should give the board pause to consider if he has the leadership skills to helm Heritage Academy. It is interesting that because of this podcast, the school put out a damage control letter stating that if any parents had questions or concerns about the school or incidents within the school, they should bring them to the administration first. I have had many phone calls over the past week telling me horror stories of what happens to families that ask questions ask for help, or report issues to the administration. Parents have told story after story where allegedly bullies, adults, and students are protected by Harrison, and the students being bullied have been further victimized by the counselor and administration and called, quote, immature and should, quote, stay off social media if they can't handle the mean comments, etc. Especially when it involves athletes. Conversations with Harrison assumed to be confidential or allegedly shared with certain faculty members or the counselor, even when the parents have requested they not be shared outside that particular discussion. Other parents have commented that Harrison has allegedly attended meetings with them only after multiple unanswered emails requesting a meeting, and then when in a finally arranged meeting, he is totally disregarded engaged and usually on his phone texting or cuts meetings short to get to a sporting event or practice, usually the football field. This has left parents feeling unheard and concerned about their students' future at the school. Parents have told me that the administration allegedly acted insulted when they asked for an accounting of fair and equal consequences after an altercation between students. Their student, the victim of bullying, was placed in in in-school suspension for two days while the bullies were not. Because the students had sporting event to participate in um, and could not if they had an ISS for any of those days. Allegedly, Harrison was angry that the parents would endanger the good of the Heritage Academy football program with their lack of understanding and questioning the decision of the administration. Other parents have told me that their children children were allegedly bullied so badly by other students online that the bullying caused severe anxiety for their student. One student was even allegedly told that they, quote, might as well kill themselves because they were so disliked by a group of students on campus. This was allegedly brought to the attention of the school, and the response was, again, stay off social media and gain some maturity. Wow. Cyber stalking and cyber bullying is a crime in the state of Mississippi. Several former students and parents allegedly went to the school because a fellow student was taking pictures under female students' skirts. Harrison shrugged his shoulders and blamed teachers for not making the kids put the cell phones in the holder by the door before class. Even though the majority of the photos were taken in common areas like the lunchroom, the hall, etc., nothing was ever done to anyone's knowledge to address this problem by the administration, despite it being a distinct violation of student conduct code. At one point, students felt things were so bad on campus and students felt powerless as well as that nothing they reported got any changes or protections that an anonymous reporting tool was created by a student to call out the bad behaviors of students, faculty, and administration. 
using social media tools available to them. The school eventually found out who was the student running the site and made them shut it down or face potential expulsion and legal battles. Multiple parents have stated in discussions with me that they feel board members and large donors' children get special privileges and are pretty much untouchable for punishment. Parents and students have stated they firmly believe that student elections have been rigged for at least since Harrison assumed control of the school as students who are sincerely disliked and totally unqualified have won elections and bragged to their classmates that they won because they were the donor's children slash grandchildren or that they were children of board members. Certain offices in the school, such as the SGA president, who, when those offices are won, guarantee the student significant scholarship money to state colleges and university for their, quote, leadership. When students or parents question these types of events, they know the student will be targeted by administration and others for not towing the party line and are clearly a threat for challenging the authority of those who rigged those elections. This is a sad situation where students learn early that authority figures are not to be trusted. Parents have shown me documentation where they had shared custody of their children while not necessarily primary custody, and that there, and that the majority custodial parent had gone to the school and said that the other parent is forbidden to come to games, events, be informed of grades, etc., despite court orders to the contrary. The school never questions the majority parent and prevents those other parent from being included in their children's lives. They appear to take to make these decisions based on what makes the best financial impact on the school or the most popular impact with that parent and not on any actual court documentation or what is best for the children. The school is a mandatory report in questions of child abuse and abandonment or neglect. Yet when told about specific incidences of abuse, they refuse to report because, quote, the child will go into foster care And while that parent is heavy-handed, the other parent is XYZ worse. They told a student whose parent was so physically and emotionally abusive one night that 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 student left home and went and stayed with another family. The former principal then told the student when the parent refused to continue paying for tuition if the child was out of the house, Are you sure you can't make up with your parent and at least finish the year there so they will continue to pay your tuition? Not one word about the child's safety, nothing about their physical or emotional well-being. It would seem they are just begging the students to return to their abuser so the school can get the rest of the year's tuition. Wow. Under Harrison's watch, A baseball coach who also taught elementary P.E. got angry with a player who was allegedly being fresh mouth and the coach allegedly slammed the student by the shoulders into a locker. While the student was disrespectful, no adult should be laying hands on a child. The coach was fired and the school has now hired Jonathan Banks to coach football and teach elementary PE in the same position. The teacher, quote, coach from New Hope, who allegedly was high, let me repeat that. The teacher coach from New Hope, who has a history in Clay County for domestic violence per newspaper articles, and who allegedly was fired from New Hope for inappropriate contact with female students. This is the same person that Harrison has hired to replace someone he fired for putting their hands on a student. Harrison apparently can't make up his mind on what type of rules to apply to whom and when he applies them as he seems to not be consistent in enforcing the school's rules from one season to the next. The school once had an honorable head of school who held a Ph.D. in educational leadership and who was a consummate educator dedicated to the students and the well-being of the school, as well as he wanted to build a community of learners who excelled first in the classroom and then on the field and in the community. 
Why on earth did the school replace Greg Carlisle, a proven asset who had been with the school almost a decade with a football coach with an English education undergraduate and a master's in instructional design and apparently no degree in school leadership at any level? And why was the former head of school completely blindsided with his removal? Why did it appear that a coup of some sort had transpired at an early board meeting in January? That is a loaded question for sure. It is alleged that it was a coup of sorts. I tend to believe that since Dr. Carlisle appeared at school the next day looking shell-shocked, that that was correct. He immediately was handing over the head of school position to Sean Harrison, who the board had selected as the interim head of school. Carlisle would allegedly stay on to the end of the semester to finish up work on an ARPA grant reporting. The ARPA grant was never mentioned again once Carlisle was out of the picture. Where did that money go? Carlisle began to work almost exclusively from home after the announcement and eventually was working completely from home before the school's term ended and Harrison took over the reins of the school. But how did it happen? While the actual events in the board meeting are not public, as this is an HR event, what went on behind the scenes before the vote and in the days and weeks before is significant to understanding how Harrison, an unqualified candidate, became interim head of school and then was formally hired as head of school after an alleged national search. How was Sean Harrison unqualified for the position based on a lack of leadership masters alone the best candidate for the job? Did they really conduct a national search? Did they interview any other candidates? Kind of makes you wonder about the board's transparency as well, doesn't it? One very believable scenario has to do with a particular family deeply invested in the school financially and apparently emotionally, who are also significant donors. Private schools love when financially capable families become their best benefactors because tuition sometimes can't readily fund the extras like buses, athletic scholarships, and extra stipends for expensive coaches' salaries. And when benefactors tempt you with big dollars or big ticket items, some board members try to court the benefactors by listening to their wishes and making them so. It is believed that this is exactly what happened with Dr. Carlisle's removal and replacement with the head football coach, Sean Harrison, who was also second in command at the school under Carlisle. The school wanted to build on their winning season and state championship that Harrison had delivered and build the school into another football powerhouse like Jackson Prep, MRA, or Hartsfield. While this is a grand aspiration, this is a difficult task to accomplish considering the size of Columbus's population compared to Jackson and the financial resources of most citizens of Lowndes County. But these board members And this benefactor family had a dream, and Carlisle was in the way of a sports-centered school dream. He had to go. So, according to some knowledgeable insiders, this is pretty much what happened. Add to that, the Harrison's family supposedly live in a house that belongs to the benefactors. It is unclear if they rent it or if it is provided to them rent-free. They spend holidays together as evidenced by social media. They take turns providing family-style dinners in an almost communal existence, supposedly, and the children of Harrison and the grandchildren of the benefactor allegedly run freely back and forth between each other's homes. Harrison also allegedly drives a vehicle owned by the benefactor. While this is lovely that the Harrisons have such great and generous friends, it seems like a huge conflict of interest that the head of school's life is so intertwined with one of the largest benefactors of the school, whose grandchildren also attend there. To add to this strange soup of familiarity, one of the grand benefactors is a super volunteer at both the elementary and the high school. She has a badge. She has the code to get in the school any hour of the day. She does not sign in like the other volunteers when she arrives. She goes behind the school counters and even fills in when the secretary is out for the day. 
She appears to have access to all information in the school when in that role. Why does Harrison permit a school volunteer to have that level of access? Is that something all volunteers are allowed? Or is it because the benefactors bought the school a used bus in 2019 and possibly, most probably, helped him get the job out of Carlisle's hands and into Harrison's? It does make you pause and think about what it costs to manipulate a school to do what a benefactor wants or needs to benefit their family most. But maybe... They are just darn generous and very altruistic folk. But who am I kidding? The amount of nepotism and incestuous hiring at Heritage is ludicrous. The amount of wasteful spending is even worse. All for football. After Harrison was made head of school, he hired Coach Pogue for six figures, allegedly, and let him bring all these Eupora kids over on scholarship. Pogue made promises of great wins and another state championship. They certainly did not win any championship that year as they lost in the first round of playoffs, and Pogue was gone after Christmas, leaving Harrison scrambling to figure out what he had to do about spring training. The amount of money that was, has gone into the sports program at the school, baseball and football and men's basketball mostly, is mind-boggling. Yet the art room has no supplies for things like pottery or ceramics on any scale, and neither Kiln allegedly has worked in years. Academic teachers are underpaid. The electronic infrastructure is hanging on with a wing and a prayer. The computer lab needs a complete overhaul. There is no music program in the high school, no drama, no arts program of any type. No plans for expansion of classroom or lab space with expanded or enhanced learning platforms for STEM classes. So why are parents paying approximately $9,000 a year for such a mediocre education in crumbling, outdated buildings? When will Heritage hire a qualified head of school who cares about the academics of the school and the success of the entire student body and not just the success of the athletic team members. It's clear the one they currently have, Sean Harrison, is not suited for the position.